Good evening. Um, welcome to this panel discussion. So we are live from Geneva. Um, you are following us on internet um, because this event was, to was supposed to be a live event, but as you've just seen on the teaser, uh, because of the current epidemic of the coronavirus, we had to have this conversation, just the three of us together. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting question anyway, so thanks so much for following us live and don't forget that you can ask questions um, commenting the video and they will be bring brought to us um, in the course of the discussion. So as you might know, today is uh, March 8, which is the International Day for Women's Rights. It's not a day for celebration, it's a day where we claim for our rights. And to do that tonight, we're going to talk about menstruation or periods, and we're going to do it with a f uh, two guests, which are Lorraine Anders Brown and Yolanda Lamini. You are the director of the film We Menstruate, and you're one of the protagonists of the film. Uh, the film, unfortunately, is not screened tonight, but we're going to watch the teaser now, and then we come back to you. I wanna marry. I wanna marry. When South Sudan became a country, it's 2011. I have lived here since 2013 because of the fighting. The reason why we come to POC is this. That time, if they get you out, they killed you. Awa, komiswasi. Ante aki. Ante aquí, ante encima. I have learned about if my, my menstruation comes, I cannot go to school without bathing. But if there is no something like stop, I cannot go to school. But if I get soap, even though I just go and beg from another person, So you just watched the trailer of Women's True Eight, uh, the film that was supposed to be screened tonight, but anyway, we're going to discuss about it. Uh, just a few words before we start on those who are not here tonight. So we were supposed to have a larger panel, uh, including a homeless person uh, from France, Axel de Souza, and a transgender man uh, from the UK, Jamie Reynes. Um, that's these two profiles are interesting because so tonight we're going to talk about periods, and um, we know that on not only women got their periods, and that's what Jamie was supposed to talk about because transgender men also got their periods. Uh, because this conversation is going to be fluid between all of us, we're going to talk about women having the periods, but we know that it's not only the case of women, but we might mention it later on in this conversation. Uh, for now, we're live from Geneva, and we are with two guests. Um, Ayanda, you came all the way from Eswatini, um, which is, for those who don't know it, a uh, country that used to be called Switzerland. Uh, you are uh, one of the protagonists of the film, and you're also a um, community worker. Um, you live with uh, HIV, and you work helping people who have HIV, so you're going to tell us more about what you do in your community and the double stigma of having your periods as a woman and being HIV positive. Lorraine, you come from the United States, but you currently live in the UK. Mm -hmm. You are an independent filmmaker uh, and photographer, very independent, because usually you go on your own. You're like self-shooting, so <laughs> you're going to tell us how you made this film. But so you directed it alone, and you did it alone. Yeah. And this is a project that you made in four to seven days. We just saw that on the teaser. Mm -hmm. Why? What does it mean for you to shoot the film this way? Thank you. Um, there have been a lot of different films made about menstruation and periods, both short form and, and I'll, I haven't seen too many long form pieces actually, but um, I really wanted to go out and make something that was like completely different than what I normally do. Um, I wanted it to be experimental. I wanted it, the process to reflect the purpose of it. And so I had this idea to make a film on menstruation and I said, I'm not, 
It's going to be completely Africa focused. I'm not going to be in it. I don't want to be in it. But what I do want to do is to make a point with the way that I make it. And so I went out to shoot and just said, whatever I shoot in four to seven days, let's see what I get. Um, and I ended up coming away in six days uh, of completing uh, principal photography. And, and it was really cool. I, I say it's the coolest documentary I've ever made um, because of that. And it's, it is actually quite amazing to look back and think of what women can accomplish when they're fully supported um, in such a short period of time. So you just recently made the documentary. Uh, it was supposed to be the European premiere. Yeah. Uh, you and Ayanda met very recently in July, so a couple of months ago. You just met today again. Uh, Ayanda, how did you appear in the film? What happened so that you become one of the main protagonists of Women's Right? How did you, I, have you been in touch with Lauren? Yes, uh, I've been in touch with Lauren. Uh, by the way, I'm Ayanda Lamini from Switzerland, and I'm HIV positive. I'm, I'm proud that I'm HIV positive. I'm an advocate, um, also a volunteer at the Ready Plus Project. So I met Lauren when we were having a conference. A conference is it's something like a monthly meeting. We, we do have a monthly meeting every time for the project, the Ready Plus Project. So Lauren came to our place, and he wanted three girls. <laughs> By the way, so I was one of the girls, and then we were at the reception, as we were at the reception sitting, and then, it's a funny story, by the way. So he was carrying, so she was carrying some uh, small biscuits, and then I asked her, uh, can I have the biscuits? And she said, you, you are the one I want, you're just open, you're just straightforward, and then I started doing the, uh, and then she goes with me at home, and then I started doing the, the documentary, and it was fine. So you were telling us that uh, you, you, you're a community worker, you do a lot of things uh, with the Ready Plus project. Can you tell us a, a few words on that? Because you just said, I'm a proud HIV positive, <laughs> which I think is amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're able to say that because you're really committed on the topic of HIV. What do yeah. you do around that? Uh, okay, uh, um, okay, the Ready Plus project, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about helping the young people to be resilient, to be empowered, so that they can adhere to their treatment every time, so that they can be virally supported, so that they can, they, they can have a high self-esteem and accept their, their status, their HIV status. So that's why I'm, I'm a volunteer on that, because I'm also HIV positive, so I know uh, every consequences, every way they are going through. So I'm, I'm also part of them. I feel like I'm part of them when I'm, I'm working with the young people. So it's a very interesting project. So yeah, <laughs> and it's, I love working with young people, you know, it's, it's always fun. Lauren, why was it so important for you? Because, so you're going to tell us more about the film, you have like six different characters, but was it, was mm. it so important for you to have someone who is HIV positive among your characters on the documentary? Sure, so um, when part of the parameters I set out for myself other than filming four to seven days was that I wanted to film with women of different decades. So each person, each protagonist uh, is from a different age across the life cycle. So we can really get a full picture of what it's like for women to uh, manage their menstruation from the very beginning to the very end, including menopause. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, when I finished this, one of the first people who reviewed it said, you know, it's not really that much about menstruation. And, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that is, part, that is a very huge component and part of it. But the other thing is, are the challenges and the other human rights issues that are involved that go around, you know, that are specifically women focused, that do or don't affect them because of their menstruation. And, um, you know, what, what, is a, what is a more in-line thing to be an advocate for, but something where, you, where you're a woman and you bleed every month, and you have to manage that for your own safety and the safety of others. And so I really did want to f find someone who'd be willing and open to talk about their status and, and what that's like. Because you know, in many instances, we, you know, we can take for granted what it's like to have our menstruation in different parts of the world. And I think it's really interesting and important to know um, what it's like for people who have to take a bit more care and a bit more awareness and take care of themselves to help protect others, really. Because as you just say, we are from three different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm from Europe, you're from the UK, you're from Africa. Africa yeah. We're different ages, um, quite similar though. But we have that in common, that we mm. are women and every month at some point, for four to seven days, we menstruate. Mm -hmm. uh, your film starts with this statement saying that 800 million people could be menstruating right now. So why are we speaking 800 million people are menstruating, which is huge and still 
Mm -hmm. It remains one of the main taboo, mm -hmm. a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. uh, it's supposed to be a, a simple body function, mm -hmm. very useful, very annoying sometimes, but it's a body function, and still something that we don't talk about usually. We don't talk about it with our parents, partners, family, but also among women sometimes who mm -hmm. don't talk about it. So this is a great opportunity tonight with three women, and we're going to talk about period. And this is already a small menstrual revolution that we're having now. So <laughs> that's, that's very cool, and I really thank you for that. Yeah. Um, maybe um, it'd be interesting if you can say a bit on the different characters that you had on the film. Yeah. So you met Ayanda in Swaziland, Eswatini. Uh, you also mm. have interesting other people. Uh, maybe we, you want to say something sure. on the, the, the person who is in jail, for instance, or the person during the, the, the hurricane in Mozambique. Sure. So we have Sunday, who's 17 years old, um, and she's a student in what's called the Protection of Civilians Camp, um, so similar to a refugee camp, but for um, South Sudanese um, in South Sudan. Uh, it's unsafe for her to go outside of this refugee camp. It's overcrowded. It doesn't have, um, you know, running water, normal toilet facilities. Uh, it is expensive for her to get supplies. Um, but most importantly, the, the sh most shocking thing I found with Sunday were these two things. One was that soap was the most important thing for her during her menstruation, to, to just not smell. Um, because when we menstruate, you know, uh, our bodies, we, we, we do emit a smell, and we don't realize that here all the time, you know? And I didn't think of it in that way, that that is one of the biggest barriers for her then going to school. So then being able to go to school and not miss three, you know, four to seven days of schoolwork, which could be tests, which could be, you know, anything learning, which completely sets her back, and then, well, if you're not going to school and you're just going to sit home so you don't smell, I mean, you might as well just get married off then at that point, right? And child marriage is a huge issue. And the first m sign of, you know, a woman menstruating, a young woman menstruating, you know, is almost like a, literally a big red flag that they're ready to get married. And, um, you know, being able to talk with Sunday about that was really important because, the unfortunate and fortunate thing is that women still don't have equal rights, um, at least in her perspective and in her social situation. And so her father was very understanding and empathetic to her wanting to finish her education, but her mother wasn't, and her mother wanted her to get married because many times it just makes it easier easier on everyone in the family. Um, I was really proud of Sunday when she, she fought to stay in school and, and she wanted to continue her education and her dad supported her in that. So it, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking and difficult situation to think that like, because her mother's rights weren't, weren't honored, you know, that you know, her rights were then spared in that sense. Um, Do you want to say something on school? D what, did you have the same experience that when you're menstruating, it was hard to go to school? No, oh, by the way, for me, it wasn't hard, but for other people in the village, other children, other adolescents, it was hard because it's, 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 it's not always that we, we have sanitary pads, so you have to stay home until you, you, you finish your menstrual period and then you go to school. But for me, it was just normal because when I started having my period pains, uh, my period, uh, I, I did have a mother, so he usually support me with the sanitary pads, but after that, it was difficult when, because my mother died when I, was, when I was 14. And then I had to take care of myself and my sister. And then I had to buy sanitary pads every month for me and for my sister. And that's when I, I started to have that difficulties. But by the way, it wasn't that much difficult. I had to use a cloth for <laughs> my period and then so that I can go to school. But the cloth is just complicated because you know, hygienic purposes, it's not good using the cloth. So it, that's why I, I, I use the cloth. I have a lot of clothes. <laughs> a lot of you mean like <laughs> rags, right? Yeah, a lot yeah. of clothes so, so, so that you I make can it change it and change and change and change. If you can't afford to buy a pad, yes. then you make it yourself yeah. out of clothes or a rag. Definitely. Who taught you? <laughs> how did you how my did grandmother, you learn? My grandmother my grandmother taught me because a long time ago there were no sanitary pads, so they were using the clothes just for when they are bleeding. As 84-year-old Coco tells us in the documentary of how women would mostly just sit by a river for four to seven days um, mm -hmm. till they finished their menstruation um, because they didn't have access to sanitary pads. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and she was in Eswatini as well when I met you um, back in July. Um, Ayanda's uh, from our 20-year-old decade. Uh, then there's Bernice, who is 34, who's a homeless woman in South Africa. Um, who sometimes had to choose between the money that she would beg for either to buy 
sanitary supplies, you know, menstrual products, or eat. Mm -hmm. uh, she couldn't just ask for money for, even though she should be able to access menstrual supplies, she couldn't, she felt like she couldn't ask for that. So she would ask for money for food and hope that people would give her enough that she could then do both with. It's, it's unfortunate that Excel can't be with us today, but so she's a French activist. Mm -hmm. She's been on the street for years, and, and she has the same discourse. So wherever you are on, on, on Earth, uh, when you're on the street, there is nothing that helps you get sanitary pads. So Axel started this campaign in France to, ha to try to have free pads for women on the street, yeah, and it's not working yet. But the story that we see on your film on this woman in Johannesburg is exactly the same. How, how do you deal with that when you have no means just to buy food? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she would, she would just use whatever she could, usually toilet paper, unfortunately, which ends up having, you know, can have hygienic consequences. Um, and then there's 43-year-old Victoria who survived Cyclone Adai um, while menstruating and, um, you know, felt, I think she gives the biggest um, visual representation of the shame that she could feel because everyone was just staring at her. She just survived a cyclone, her sister died, and yet she was full of shame for the fact that she was bleeding while she was being carried out of the, the rising waters. 50-year-old uh, Christina, who is an activist from Zimbabwe, who was jailed and was turned away even by a female prison guard to have her help her get her a pad, who had to use her bra, like would do a makeshift pad with her bra because she just wouldn't stop bleeding. Um, and then there's 63-year-old Dr. Deneo, who I loved. She's from um, Lesotho, but working in South Africa, and a huge um, advocate for menopause and research, and especially within the African communities that I thought was, I mean, she just had so much to say and just so much wisdom and information, too, because, the, you know, the, the taboo starts when we're in, in, as a teenager, right, when we first start menstruating. It, it only continues and perpetuates to when we get older. And when menopause comes, you just, you know, unfortunately, like even I just assume, okay, great, so that just means you're not menstruating anymore. Um, you get hot flashes and it's slightly uncomfortable, but there's a lot of medical consequences too. Yeah. And so I think for the really important message I wanted to take away with this uh, documentary was to normalize menstruation, make it an everyday simple conversation you could have. Mm -hmm you know, over dinner table with men or with women, you know, I mean, we don't have to go into the nitty gritty of it, but to be able to be, you know, able to not be silent because then that means that we won't be silent about other things. Yeah, definitely. Because, and it's interesting how all the examples you gave on the film on like she needs to take paper or whatever just to protect herself. That just like, I think anybody, any person who has, who's been interesting at some point listening to us right now, I'd experienced that at some point. How many times you're just like on the bus, at the office, mm -hmm. at school, outside, and just shit, it's that moment of the day, uh, that moment of the month, and so what do you do? So this is something that we all have in common, Yeah. and thus, mm. we don't talk about it. It's, it's, it's crazy, um, because obviously I'm not a francophone, so to, m to prepare for the discussion, I made some research on how do you say period in English, the different way, mm. different words you can have to say period in English, and I found out some interesting things. Okay, so obviously there's bleeding, that's mm -hmm. fine, but there's that time of the month, but mm -hmm. I also found something that is the curse. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent this is used in English, but the curse says a lot uh, on how it... Wh wh what is the name in, in the sweat? <laughs> the curse. Yeah, no, for menstruation, how do you say it? Comenza. Uh, uh, and does it have this... Uh, heavy connotation, heavy meaning? Or is it something you can say in public? Or is it a word that you only say with your, like, say, your sister uh, and no, grandmother? No, it's something you can say in public, by the way. Yeah, it's something, it's like menses, you know. So it's something, it's not uh, a word that is so complicated. So you can say it even in public. Is there words that m are well, There are other words that are so far, I can't even say them here. <laughs> <laughs> even though we don't understand, obviously. Uh, no, I can't say them here. <laughs> that's, that's just bad. They are so vulgar about menstruation, so I, I, I don't think it's a good platform, platform to say them there. <laughs> In case your little sister is watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but... Yeah, as you're saying, um, we never spoke about it in public. I think it's the first time I'm ever speaking about my period in public, and mm -hmm. I think my fa my family is watching. Mm. Uh, it's 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 something weird. I remember the first day uh, when in my feminist journey, 
when instead of when I had my period asking a friend or a colleague like, do you have a tampon? I dare asking the whole office, does someone has a tampon or does someone has a pad to ask everyone around and I felt really powerful this day and I think the, it changed the way we felt as as women, uh, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, why do you think... Uh, yeah, why did we ever whisper in bathroom stalls? Like, like we should be able to just ask each other in a normal level voice. Why, why did I ever whisper and be like, excuse me, do you have a method? <laughs> <Yeah>. See, everyone's <laughs> done it. I, like, why did we whisper? So why do we whisper? I don't know. Well, I mean, but this is what I was trying to explore, like, you know, to try and... You know, words are so powerful. Words are, you know, um, they can either uh, discriminate or they can, yeah. they can, you know, or they can take away power and just make it, make it normal and easy and simple. And so, so much of, of what um, the documentary looks at is, you know, I really wanted to use the word menstruation as much as possible because that's, that's the medical term, that is the actual term, and, and it doesn't really have a stigma. Like, it just is what it is. Yeah. Although the title for the film came from the fact that I was, uh, you know, a bit, um, I didn't like that the word menstruate didn't have woman in it, and it, it generally happens mostly to, to women. So uh, that's where the inspiration for the, the name of the word came. And also to make it an easy thing to say, like an empowering thing, rather than feeling disempowered or, or that it was taboo. So we see the taboo is everywhere. I was um, saying that in some traditional situation in mm. Italy, for instance, you couldn't cook the 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 the, the, the sauce for the pasta when you were menstruating. Uh, in UK, I read that you can't make bread because it won't work. And you had an interesting story. What's what's the traditional misconception that women should not do when they are menstruating? You know, in, in Switzerland, <laughs> it's a, a complicated thing because when you when you menstruating, you don't cook because they think you're smelling, so the food, they think the food is, will be not okay when you're cooking, and there are certain plants that you don't touch when you are on messes. What kind of plants you can't uh, touch? Uh, it's, uh, it's like vegetables. You can't touch vegetables because they believe like when you're touching the vegetable, they will shrink because you are on, in, on your messes. So <laughs> it's got a lot of traditions, yeah. And is it still on, or is it something that it's changing. It's changing bit by bit. It's still on, but it's changing bit by bit because they, they now they, they introduce a curriculum in, in schools about menstruation, about changes in the body and everything that I think it's changing a bit by bit, but it's not that, uh, uh, how can I explain it? <laughs> it's not that, it, that everyone knows about it because the old people, they still believe in that traditions things, you know. And in your work as a so your life mentor also to some young girls who has mm -hmm. uh, HIV positive, mm -hmm. uh, do they think the same? Do you have to teach them that, or they already know it's okay to have their period? Uh, uh, yeah, I do. I do educate them uh, on that, on how to put a pad and the hygiene purposes and everything. I do educate them. I we we just do discussion about that. So and everything, how to how to dispose it because we 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 don't we don't feel okay <laughs> that's why i want to break that barrier because I, I, it's not good because I, like lauren said that when you we want to pay you just whisper do you have a pet <laughs> and yeah i just want to break that barrier. We, we mustn't be ashamed that you are on periods because it's a natural thing by the way so we don't have to be ashamed about that so i i educate them about that that they have to be free about this. Uh, I, I even make an example in the documentary that menstruation is almost the same with wet dreams, just that we, we, we bleed blood and then wet dreams just happen once at night, but it's almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, I know that there's not an audience here to watch it and hear the reaction, but the, the premiere in the UK, everyone loved that line from you. I just wanted <laughs> to, I never got to tell you that. Um, everyone really under, and anyone who's watched it and I've watched it with you, it's completely resonated with them. Like, yeah, that is, that is the closest similarity you can make yeah. for someone of the opposite sex to kind of try and understand what, what they could possibly feel and what it could be like, you know, to, yeah. to have this thing that happens to you that's a natural bodily function that you can't control that, you know, and that sh people should just accept with and, and get on with life with, you know? Yeah, because what your film shows quite nicely is that the issue with periods is not that you're bleeding, mm -hmm. it's not that it's painful, it's like people are, are, are making you feel shameful. Mm -hmm. And usually yeah. the young men, 
in cases of school, school students, they make you feel you shameful of ha just having something happening into your body. Mm. Uh, is it more complex for you who are HIV positive? Do you think that there's this double stigma that we were mentioning? Yeah, there is stigma uh, because, okay, uh, I, uh, I, I like to, <laughs> to go back to the documentary. I even mentioned to the document that, you know, when putting the, the, the sanitary pills, you, you feel like uh, people will, will be infected by your, when you blot yourself, uh, let me make an example, you are just sitting here, so you blot yourself, I feel like, uh, I felt like, <laughs> for personal reasons, I felt like, oh, if I blot myself, people will, be get, it will get infected, but by the way, I learned that, no, they won't, <laughs> they won't, so it's a natural thing, and they won't get uh, the infection when I'm, I'm on my period, so that's why I open up just like that, just, uh, I'm not ashamed of it, it's a natural thing, so I'm breaking that barrier right now. But you have to tell everyone, hey, I'm HIV positive, I'm menstruating, but there's no risk for you, they yes, don't, you definitely. have to explain that every time? No, I don't have to explain that every time, because I, I think... Uh, what by, uh, 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 I don't know how to put it, but I think everyone, if he or he or he or sh he or she understand that I'm on periods and I'm, and I'm HIV positive, I, it doesn't mean that I can infect you. It's just that I'm on period. I'm like uh, I'm like Lorraine, who's HIV negative. So it's the same thing. That's uh, the, the, my body reacts the same way like Lorraine. So they don't have to discriminate me for that. Cool. It's it's it's. I think it's amazing that people like you are teaching other people so that we can change our mentalities. And even mm -hmm. here, we don't we know very few things about HIV. So I think you're doing a great job in in doing that, and that's really helpful for many people. And I learned a lot from talking with you on that. Um, I think I'd like to. You mentioned quickly that uh, sometimes you don't have money to buy pads, and you have to make your own pads. Uh, mm. That's that's a new concept that's been developing. I've discovered it like two years ago. The idea of menstrual precarity, the fact that some women can't afford to have pads or can't afford to buy uh, pads. And or in the UK, it's, they say it's period poverty. They say period poverty, the too. okay, yep. period poverty. Um, we have some numbers on Switzerland because we're in Switzerland. In the average life of a woman, uh, we're gonna spend about 4,000 Swiss francs, which is about like $4,000 buying pads and buying painkillers and buying a lot of stuff. Um, Scotland just voted a law that says that it should be free for everyone. So do you think that things are slowly changing? How do you see it from your perspective? We've been doing research on that. Oh, definitely. And, and they have to change. I mean, if, if I was to use, and I've, you know, at this point, I've already used disposable products now for about 20, over 20 years of my life. But if I was to continue with that for the rest of my, you know, menstruating lifetime, uh, I would fill an entire school bus basically with products. And we're just, you know, we have a climate crisis, you know, it, and it's just getting worse. And this is one place where we can actually make a difference and choose um, different, different options in order to reduce that and also make things more comfortable and safe for women. So, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with people who have made and made films on menstrual cups, which are awesome. Um, I've used uh, the Thinks reusable uh, washable underwear. Um, and there's all kinds of new products that are coming out all the time. And I think that that also helps, you know, it helps to reduce the waste but it also makes a sustainable way for some people to be able to access products. So um, I, you know, I was lucky to be a part of a menstrual cup education and distribution in uh, the Lake refugee camp in Malawi. And, and the women were so happy to be able to have something they could rely on for 10 years. They didn't have to find a way to go and like scrape money together each month to go and get pads. And they could be, they could, I mean, for anyone who hasn't used a menstrual cup who menstruates, like absolutely try it because I'm completely changed by it. You can, you really can do anything when you're, you know, you can go in the water, you can play sports. Um, yeah. And you just, you don't have to think about spending that money. Um, it's just a reliable and comfortable thing to use. And you, you know, you have it for 10 years and it, it helps make a difference in, you know, we have to start thinking about the next generation. And so if we can reduce having an entire school bus full per person, of wasted menstrual products, then that's amazing. And it gives, it helps people, uh, you know, in situations like Bernice or anyone who's homeless, the opportunity to be able to um, take care of themselves when that happens each time every month. 
Do you think you're going to use your new menstrual cup? Because you, you got one today. Definitely, definitely. Wha what do you think? Do you think it can change things for you to have a menstrual cup instead of I, I, buying I pads? I, need, I, I think this is it's, it's, it's the cheap way because I, 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 will be, I won't buy pads for almost five years. So it's, it's a very cheap way. Definitely, I'm going to use it. Do you think you might start teaching, you know, in your education classes, teaching girls how to use it? To yes, young I will. women. I will definitely. And I think it's it's it will be cheap. It, it will be cheaper in my in my village because most of the girls are they they can't afford for, for sanitary pads. If I introduce this, I think it will be the best way for them to save money to mm -hmm. save everything. You see. But, I mean, here we are, we're talking about menstrual cups, which I can't tell you I would have done two years ago, firstly. And, mm. and secondly, part of the opportunity is only if you have the communication, the understanding, and the information to be able to know about it and to know that these things exist by opening and starting that conversation. So by starting to be able to own the word menstruation and to be able to say it out loud in a public forum on a stage, under lights, in front of cameras right now, that helps to open up the conversation so people can find and learn about things that can help make you know, that time of the month a bit more manageable for women everywhere. Yeah, what if the cups were something that we just given for free to all of us at some point in our life? What if at when you enter school you'd be given pads, tampon and cups that would change many the many things for the everyday life of many people? Girls wouldn't have to worry about not going to school. Yeah. I remember the first time I had my cup and I was like, it changed my life. So I'm, I'm so happy for you that you're just go starting this journey. <laughs> <laughs> But we were talking about the smell, for instance. The yes. cups change it all. Mm -hmm. Because we don't yeah. have the smell anymore. Yeah, yeah. Which is huge, you know. Y like, I, I don't think I really fully appreciated, you know, because we have, you know, any products that we'll use here in the U.S., the U.K., Europe will, you know, naturally be perfumed or, you know, try and be absorbent to avoid that, you know. So it's been years I haven't really, really thought about that. Also, my own, as Ayanna put so well in the documentary, my own dis self discrimination of just not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to think about it, just wanting to black it out. Um, and, and not really understanding how important it is to n not have that smell as part of, you know, part of every month for you um, until Sunday said, yep, most important thing is if I can buy soap. Like, forget trying to buy pads, if I can buy soap. You know, and that, that's huge um, to, to, to just rethink of what we actually need and what, what it means to be able to, you know, provide someone with these supplies at a fair and reasonable cost. I mean, so happy for Scotland, and we need to see more of that in this world. But what did the smell, the idea that the smell is something bad, is just also the consequences of a patriarchal system that mm -hmm. says that you, we should not have this happening in our body because the smell is not a disturbance for us, but for the other people around. That's something that we have, we have been taught. Um, It perpetuates the cycle. Yeah. Um, the cycle of not being able to talk about it, of silencing, you know, um, and then of just not trying to explore our bodies or, or participate in normal way in society the same way that, me equally to the way that men do. The first time you had your period, you were 13, you said? Yes. You knew what was happening? You, you were already <laughs> aware or there was a surprise for you? Oh, it was a, it was, it was a surprise, you know. I, I thought uh, I'm injured because I, it started when I was in school <laughs> and I was doing from, from one. It's, it's great, I don't know, here, I think it's grade 11. So when I, was, uh, uh, when I go to the toilet, I found a spotted blood and I thought I'm injured and I rushed back home and I told my mom, oh, I have some spotted blood here and she sat with me and told me everything, <laughs> explained that, no, you're going up now, so you're starting your menstrual cycle, so you have to stay clean and everything. She explained every steps for me, so, and she, show, she, show, she shows me how to put a sanitary pad and yeah, but it was funny because I thought I was injured and then I was like, how come? Because I, uh, I never play with <laughs> bed and, you know, What about you? When were your first periods? You know what's terrible? I can't tell you. And I think that's probably like a byproduct of just not like trying to black out whenever that would really happen, like when I was younger. I mean, I think I was about 11. Um, it's interesting doing this documentary, like so many people remember when they actually first got it. And, and I get a bit jealous because like, I, I can't really remember that. And I think 
that's a huge testament to why I really wanted to make this because for me, I think I was just like, nope, it's not something to be talked about as private matter, slightly shameful, just, just don't think about it. Um, so I can't really tell you. Uh, so who taught you how to use a pad or a tampon or a cup? Oh, the, uh, well, I was living with my mother at the time, so it was my mother. Um, but I remember being hugely embarrassed about not being able to get a tampon to work. That I remember. Um, but otherwise, like the exact the exact moment or time or you know anything I, that moment I remember, but I don't remember like when it actually first started. Um, but we were told in you know in school we had health and sexual education, so we we knew beforehand that we weren't injured. Um, but it didn't make it any easier. Didn't make it any like less isolating um, and taboo, I guess, in a sense, um, which. I'm hopeful that uh, you know in today's curriculum and future generations, and then you know whenever I have children, that will be very different for them. My experience was different. It was not that of a taboo because the first time I had my period, I think I was like maybe 14 or I mean I think I was quite old already. Older, All my yeah. friends had it, mm -hmm. and I was like, something's wrong with me. You know, I'm like I'm not yeah. a, a proper woman. This is not happening to me. So I remember the first time I had it, and I have an older sister, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm the last children. So the first time I had it, I was like. Phew, I'm normal, but I was very afraid of not never having them. So th for me, that was a pride. I was looking forward to the moment when I would be an adult mm -hmm. and I could have my period because, but we had been taught in school and my friends had them already. And, and I think that's something that bounds uh, women together. So my, mm. the first time I put a tampon, there was a friend who explained me. The first pad was my mother. Um, and we were discussing also the fact that um, when you live with women, either your colleagues, your flatmates, your partner, um, your hormones can influence their hormones. So mm -hmm. if someone is menstruating, can be menstruating at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's a saying that we bleed together somehow. <laughs> that mm -hmm. happens to you, right? Yeah, it happens to me. <laughs> Every time when I sit next to someone who's on hand menstruation, I, I just start menstruating just right by way. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you live with your sister too, so that that probably has something yeah. to do with it. Every time well. when my sister goes to to menses, I also go to menses. I don't know what's happening to my body because, and uh, my menses are just so bad because I, I usually vomit, uh, I've got a lot of pain. So yeah, they're so bad. I, sometimes I just go maybe twice a month, and sometimes I just go maybe. After a month, mm -hmm. so um, I, it's it's just irregular. My menses are just irregular. I'm not just like every month I'm going to maybe twice a month, or the next month I'm not going, and the next month I'm going. The next it's just my menses are just different. I don't know what's happening to my body. Yeah, I have irregular periods too. Yeah, um, which which for me for a, a long time I think I was quite I was quite quiet about since it wasn't normal, and so felt like. I couldn't really talk about it because, uh, or if I did, it would just, you know, it would make me seem odd or, or I don't know, maybe slightly shameful or something. Um, but uh, I learned after, like, I went a whole month without getting my period and, and was quite scared at that point as to why I didn't get it, that I just have irregular periods and it's just that, and that, that irregularity is normal too, um, which is important to know. It's part of the taboo that the fact that because we don't talk about it. We mm -hmm. think it's something individual. So if I don't get it, I have something wrong. Yeah. If I have pain, the way you have it, something wrong. I think it's individual. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's something social, it's global, it's something political. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting example is the fact of endometriosis, mm -hmm. which is an, a disease that affects 10% of the women on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them don't know they have it. Exactly. And they don't know they have it because they can't talk about it. Yeah. And they don't talk about it because we don't have conversations like this like openly this, yeah, enough. Yeah. Mm. Imagine if men would be menstruating. Do you think we would have the same pains? No. Oh, who is so um it's a BBC presenter who just wrote a book that I read, Emma Barnett. Uh, she gave a great explanation in there, definitely read it. So the book's called Period, and it said if men had periods, basically, and it was this whole chapter on like, you know, there'd be, you know, They'd be they'd be bragging to each other about their periods. <laughs> they'd be you know they would have sure they'd, they would. they'd have they'd be have special <laughs> concessions for their for their periods. You know they'd have almost competitions and stuff. Yeah. And it's just like yeah, it wouldn't be like this 
quiet, shameful, not talked about, made you to so feel that, discriminated against. Yeah, that's why I ask myself, why are you so, why are we so ashamed of our peers? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, men, they usually speak by about everything that yeah. is happening in their bodies. But we as ladies, we're just ashamed of, of being in men's. So I just ask myself, why? And uh, I find myself no answer with that because we we just so conserve about. I, I don't know. Maybe we take it. It's a wrong thing that is happening to our body. I don't know. <laughs> no. It's societal and it's everywhere, you know. Um, and but I love that it's changing now. You know, that's the most important thing. Like we can look yeah. back on it yeah. and and be like, that was ridiculous that you couldn't cook for someone just because you had your period. Mm -hmm. And we could, you know, we could keep talking about it. We can keep perpetuating the taboos. But the most important thing is if we really focus on like. It's great. We've learned what we've learned. How can we move forward and make this a comfortable conversation and a normal everyday existence? Yeah. And we have to say that it is a global issue. Mm. Yeah. Like we've been able Indeed. to reach the moon. We don't know yet how to uh, to to ease uh, the premenstrual syndrome or the pain the pains that we have when we're menstruating. So this is something crazy. Mm. Um, I'm looking forward to a society where, where women have power and we can maybe change things. Um, that'd be great. Uh, the time is running and we were supposed to have some questions coming from the audience, the online audience. Ah, uh, here they are. Thank you very much. So, okay, I'll go through the questions that just arrived. Okay. Um, the first one is, Scotland will introduce free health protection. Will this happen soon in France or worldwide? Do you have any idea? I mean... We hope go so. and vote for more women in office in order to be able to get your voices heard. Um, I mean, there has been some some great men, I have to say. You know, we've been talking a lot about women, but there have been some amazing men who have been trying to be more supportive um, of women's menstrual products and, and having them be more accessible. Um, I can't remember his name specifically, but there was a U.S. House of Representatives person who tried to put through uh, menstrual products as, as an expense, you know, just like toilet paper, that actually <laughs> got held up and questioned. And then, um, but then they ended up passing it. So, um, you know, slowly but surely, I think, you know, the squeaky wheel, as they say, the squeaky wheel is getting the oil. You know, um, more people stand up and talk about it and make, you know, make a difference. And that, and that includes men too. You know, some of the, some of the supporters, the biggest supporters of Women's Trade have been men. Um, who donated for the crowdfund. And uh, I think that if we make it comfortable for them, then they make it comfortable for us. But it also means getting more women in office because they're the ones who it actually directly affects and, um, and can, uh, can speak to it the most um, and, and, and push through with getting that kind of legislation and, and real change, big change to happen. Do you think this could happen soon in Eswatini to have free menstrual products? Have you heard the people talking about the fact that that could be that could happen? Yeah, I heard about it, and uh, we also uh, in my project we also do <laughs> we also provide for for the uncles, but once in a while because it's not uh, something that is sustainable. But we also provide for them the menstrual uh, the sanitary pods for free, but <laughs> it's not something that is uh, sustainable. That's why I, I was I was saying about this. What's the, what's the uh, cup? The cup. I, I mm -hmm. thought it's, it would be a, a, a much better change because uh, we we know that the the young girls will have for this cup for for almost five years. You see, mm -hmm. so I think that's uh, uh, that's the the better way than providing the sanitary pods every time. You know, for free. While we can provide this cup just. Why once in a while, and um, actually, you, uh, UNFPA have started in um, disaster zones of uh, giving out um, reusable menstrual packs. So uh, whether it be underwear or like rewashable pads and whatnot, um, as part of either dignity kits or specifically just menstrual supplies. So y you are seeing it more as a consideration in humanitarian crises. Um, we definitely need to see it more in everyday life as well. Switzerland is not discussing for now the fact that it could be free, but for now the tax is different. Mm -hmm. It has a higher tax, and the same in the UK, I think, but in Switzerland the, the, the pads have a higher tax than, for instance, uh, some uh, other um, daily products for men also, so it's slowly changing. But the University of Geneva tried to implement some some free pads in the toilets. It's not My happen. home state of New York has gotten rid of uh, the tampon tax which I'm very proud of. Um, and so if we just have more people that, even if it's state by state in the US, you know, push things through, that will make a huge difference. So for Switzerland, it's a direct democracy. So for everyone's watching, just 
vote for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the second question is, we hardly talk about pain and diseases mm. related to menstruation, such as endometriosis. How can we, can we change, that? change that? How can we change that, the fact that we don't talk about it? Well, we just did. We did. Um, mm. I'll never forget, like most recently, I went into, I was working in an office in January and went into the office, and it was actually really refreshing to have a colleague say to me, Oh, I really hate the first day of my period. Just out loud, you know? Um, and I think it's important that we listen to them. Um, if someone's menstruating, we don't, we don't just try and shrug it off because it makes us slightly uncomfortable. And we, you know, we ask, like, how bad is it, you know? Because I think at the really, we've been quiet for so long on the topic, at least, yeah. you know, s socially or work-wise, that um, things like endometriosis have gone unnoticed and undiagnosed for so many people. And endometriosis is not a joke. It's not. It's not just, you know, you're you're slightly cramped, um, or you're, you know, you feel like you have an upset stomach. It's quite serious. And if you don't listen to the person who might have pains, and give them support, or at least let them think about like maybe going to seek extra help, um, then they could live their whole life with it. And we, as we know, that any one woman who has endometriosis could not have a family. They're 30 to 40% less likely to be able to carry a child. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's completely curable. Like you can, you can go and have surgery for endometriosis if you, know, if, you know, if you speak up, get the resources that you need to, and get the help that you can. So let's make it a topic. Yeah, it's exactly. A topic. And listen, just yeah. listen. In your case, so you have terrible pains the first two days. When you don't go to work, what happens? Do you have someone, supervisor, or colleagues that understand that you can't go to work when you have pain? Yeah, they do, uh, they do understand that I, I can't go to work because my, my pains are so severe. So uh, uh, I think this, this thing is all about you being open so that you can get help, you know. So when, you, when as we as women, when we, if, if ever we can be open about pure pains and everything, I think we can get even help about everything. Like Lorraine was saying that we have to speak help. So wh whenever we speak out, so we will, you'll be able to, be, to get up. If ever, you're so quiet, so no one will help you, so we have to speak up. And I think involving men, you know, if we can involve men in this change. That's <laughs> the third question. What can cis men, what can men can do to help? You know, men, they have to support us. They, they don't have to discriminate us because this is a natural thing. So we have to involve them in discussion like this. I thought we would have just the men just <laughs> voicing out what can we do, what can we support, you know, so, so that there the, will be no despair. I think that you are on message, you know. Yeah, I think it's the first way like that. Stop cringing um, if it's ever brought up. Uh, and, you know, I just had a wonderful conversation with um, two of my Liberian colleagues where I learned that, um, so we were talking about how language is so important and they, they call uh, their word for, they use a word for pads, they are called blue biscuits. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they you yes, use blue yeah, biscuits we, too. We, we used to so biscuits. there's, uh, there's, it's just a, it's like a comfortable way to talk about pads or tampons, basically. And so their daughters will, will, or their partners will ask them, Dad, I, I need some blue biscuits this month. Yeah, and they'll be like, okay. Mm. And then they go to the shop and they go buy blue biscuits. And there's just something about that comfortable word that makes it an okay topic for them to have that conversation yes, about. Yeah. Do you have the same word? <laughs> we have the same word. <laughs> Does it come from the fact that the blood is always blue in the ads for pads? Uh, I think it comes from the fact that Kotex is a very popular brand and it, their, their color is blue. So I don't think it comes from the commercials, you know, in that sense, um, which is a whole other topic and point to make. But uh, well, however it came about, this nickname, I thought it was so endearing because it just opened up a conversation between a father and a daughter that, you know, I've never even had that that level of comfort with my father, and I love him dearly. Um, so I thought that you know communication and, and word choices are really important, and just and just not cringing, you know, just like being like, okay, we we will do this, you know, making them feel okay about it. Would you ask um, a dad, a father, a brother, or a mate friend to go and buy you pets? That's something you could do. Ask yeah. a man. Yeah, I cool, I cool. Because uh, I don't think he, he has to be ashamed of that because, you know, he has to su support me in every, every mm -hmm. way. You know, I, I usually, uh, I'm sorry to talk about personality, I usually ask my boyfriend, just, I, I want to see uh, his reaction. I just ask You test it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, just buy, please buy me for pets. And I want to see the reaction for him. And then 
every time I, I think maybe he understand that <laughs> I every woman goes to to menstruation. So you just say, Oh, you're saying the biscuit thing, okay. I will tell them. <laughs> <laughs> so you say pads, he said biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's already something. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question to you, Lauren, on your film. Someone is asking, what was the main goal of the documentary? To normalize menstruation and to give, uh, to amplify the voices of, of women in Africa with their experiences and the different human rights issues that surround menstruation, that it's, it's something that has existed since the dawn of time. It doesn't have to in this sense, but it does have a direct implication on women's, like other parts of women's life and their rights in other ways. And so if we can normalize this, then it is one step closer to supporting, you know, the full human rights that are deserved to women. Um, and I chose Africa because it's a continent that's very close to me. And I think that there's a lot of different interesting lessons learned from the different people. I mean, I love, I loved meeting Ayanda. I loved meeting all of the women in it. And I think that, um, so many of the things that parts of their stories you can take away are uh, you can see in your own life too like i don't think it's it we know it's not something that is just uh you know that just affects africa i think it's just nice that all the women come from this part of the world and all have similar yet different stories so the focus was really to make it a conversation that we could have over a dinner table with whoever's sitting around that father boyfriend whatever um and to therefore get us one step closer to having equal human rights. Would you make the similar film next in Asia, Europe? Yeah, I'd love to make Women Straight Asia, Women Straight Europe. I think that it's uh, definitely worthy of a series. Um, can be shot in four to seven days. Uh, and I think there's still so many more topics that are connected to this top, th to menstruation that we could talk about and cover. I mean, we didn't even talk about the environmental impact. We didn't talk about cups, you know, I mean, there's so many different mm -hmm. things. And And it just, it helps, I think, towards the end of it to, to make you feel like, yeah, this is a conversation we can have. It's easy. We should also mention that you had an all-female crew. Yes, yeah, so I had, uh, well, all-female crew. I mean, I, so I, I directed, shot, and did the sound recording. So, so it's you, the crew? So it was me, the crew. And then post-production, I had um, a sound mixer and a composer. Um, who were female, and that's really important to me because not enough women are represented in the film industry. So I really try and, and support and uplift them. I love working with the men that I've worked with in the industry, don't get me wrong. Um, there's some really talented people I've had an amazing opportunity to work with, um, but uh, there's something really wonderful with working with all women on a crew. The fifth question is um, that period protection costs a lot. How can we help precarious women to have access to it? Uh, so we're talking about period poverty then? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, well, supporting programs like the one that Ayanda is working in, um, where where they you know they they give out pads when they need to um, and supplies um, through education. Um, there's the African Menstrual Health Cup Coalition. So to get more cups in places in Africa. Yeah. That's that's um, and they're an independent. You should be in touch on that topic. Yeah, <laughs> they're an independent organization that um, that works with educating uh, women on cups and distributing them. Um, there's, uh, I mean, you can support UNFPA in their work and their in a lot of humanitarian crises with dignity kits. You can give to dignity kits. Um, but even just you know, I know in the UK there's down at the local supermarket, there's like a section that you can give to people who are disadvantaged, migrants or refugees, um, supplies that they might need. So like instead of just buying a tin of beans, like buy some pads, put them in there, you know? Um, uh, uh, I, there's also a program in the UK called Bloody Good uh, Project, which helps to do that as well um, on a bigger scale rather than just going down to the supermarket. They distribute pads, um, again, to people who suffer from period poverty or menstrual supplies and similar things happening in Switzerland that yep. there's an association in Geneva called Famabor which has been collecting pads for um, for women and there is a different program there's an association all over Switzerland so if you if you google it if you're in Switzerland you find it but in other countries I'm sure you can find things but I'd really love to ask you know big businesses you know for example I've only been in one airline lounge that ever had menstrual products in it and that was the American Airlines lounge in JFK and I hate to say I fly a lot 
And so, you know, big businesses, you know, public s spaces, you know, places where they can actually afford to put these supplies out yeah. for women yeah. to take, mm. make them affordable and accessible yeah. by just putting them in the bathroom. Don't make women yeah. have to go find either find money if they even have it you know um g have to go out to a pharmacy to go and get it and then to go back in in order to take care yeah. of it because sometimes we just don't have that option either so make them accessible where they're needed and not like just putting a coin in you know like make them free you you give toilet paper away give menstrual supplies away everywhere like everywhere yeah like condoms no condoms are, yeah. are, are free so yeah. why, why don't you make <laughs> this sanitary place for free? So that those, those girls out there who, who doesn't afford to buy the sanitary place would be have the access to, to mm -hmm. have pets and everything. So I think it's almost the same thing like condoms, just that you, if we ever, uh, I'm not saying we have to stop using, uh, we have to stop providing condoms for free, but if ever we can make menstruation a priority, you see, you, th you see, I think uh, uh, like making sex a priority because sex sometimes it's it's a choice, you know. Mm. So if sex is a choice, but uh, so yeah, but menstruation isn't for uh, women. Why menstruation is not a choice? It's something yeah. that is natural that happens every month of a girl. So we have to have uh, the access of me of sanitary pearls. Oh, you see, <sighs> definitely, yeah. Um, in some countries. That's the last question, and we have four minutes left, so that's perfect. perfect. Mm -hmm. In some countries, women are locked away during their days, seen as impure. Clear violation of human rights, indeed. What can be done? So none of us are lawyers, but things change. I mean, the fact that you talk about it and say this is not impure to have your periods is already changing. So talking around you about the fact that it's not a good thing to do. In your case, what you've been experiencing in different countries, what can you do? What can be done? Well, that's hard. So I think the question is relating directly most likely to Chowpati in Nepal, which is a practice that's been there for you know, a very, very, very long time. And it's quite ingrained. In, and it's not everywhere in Nepal. It's only in certain parts of Nepal. Um, so, uh, you know, people have been destroying the cow sheds that they send women to as, as trying to, you know, move forward with it. But it, it has to be more than that. You can't just destroy the, the walls that bind the women. You have to also, like, give them support and, and truly be supporting them. You know, you, you destroying the house doesn't mean that you're going to be any more welcoming to them when it's that time of the month for them, you know? Um, so... It's interesting. So there, you know, I do want to do some work in Nepal with menstruation, actually, and a lot of really great people are already doing work there to try and connect the communities and do um, use immersive theater um, to try and have people s just look at at the way that it's been differently to try and see where they can go forward with it. So definitely uh, empowering young girls, empowering women um, to try and be able to speak up for themselves, yeah. um, I'd say. Uh, and and also not not making anyone feel shame for the way it was, but to, to just try and focus on a better future, I guess, when it comes to human rights, women's rights and menstruation. menstruation. Yeah. Like, don't make anyone feel bad for it. Like, we've already felt bad long enough. We don't need to do that anymore for anyone of our sex or the opposite sex. We just need to make sure that this is not something that is the first place where women stay silent. Because if they stay silent about their menstruation, then they can stay silent about any diseases that they may get. Yeah. They can stay silent about, you know, bigger conditions like FGM or, you know, any kind of uh, abuse or violence. Um, and so menstruation is really like one of the first places where we silence ourselves. So let's just allow people to speak up about it. You want to add something? <laughs> no, no, no. He already said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> well, from your perspective, though, from someone, you know, who, who has, who has, you know, it, which can be looked like as a double stigma. Where do you find your strength from Ayanda? You know, how do you, how are you able to talk so passionately about it? Um, and what would you want to hope for, to to give that to other women? How do you do that? No, okay. Um, where do you find the strength? 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, where do I find the strength, just that I don't know. I don't know how to explain it because uh, maybe it's my personality, by the way, because I, I'm just one person who's open, who's bubbly, who's so friendly. Maybe that's, that's helped me every time just to, to open up in every issues that I, 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 I face in life, you see. So maybe, and also working with other young people, seeing different types of people, different personalities, maybe it's helped me just to gain every day <laughs> so that I can be open to to ev to everyone I meet in life, <laughs> I think. By the way, I don't know how to explain it. We need more Ayandas in life. Yes. Um, you have any uh, recommendation that you would tell to a young girl who would start her menstruation? What would you tell her? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I I have. I I think. When you start menstruation, I think you have to open up because, like Lauren said, you, you, you op being open starts when when you you are menstruating. Just be open that oh, I'm menstruating, and tell ev everyone mm -hmm. so that they can help me, they can love you, they can give you support in everything. Because you start by opening about menstruation and then you'll be able, able to open about other issues that you face in life. Like whenever you have uh, maybe a disease, you'll be open to that because you have opened yourself on menstruation and then you will be open to when you have uh, maybe abuse, something like Lorenzo, maybe someone abuses you, you'll be able to open up because we have started be being open uh, about menstruation. So I can say, let's be open. You know, let's pick up. <laughs> let's not be ashamed of of our menstruation. It's, it's something that is natural, so we don't have to be ashamed of. We have to open up and uh, and and go out to the world and say that I'm menstruating. So <laughs> what? So what? So I think you have to love me the way I am, because it's a natural thing, by the way. I think that's the perfect conclusion. Mm. I'm menstruating. So what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks to you two to come to Geneva tonight, despite all the threat that we have on health issues now. Uh, thanks so much to everybody at the, the team of the festival for putting to the putting the discussion, organizing this event, all the technical staff and everyone organizing the the event. Uh, it was a hard job for everyone at the festival to change the, the 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 program in the very last minute so thank you for that and thank you for uh, having this opportunity to talk about period tonight as not only a women's right but a human's right so we're changing the world slowly but that's something we have to to keep doing so today is 8 of march but tomorrow is 9 of march and we have to keep fighting for women's rights so yeah. let's keep on the good work and thank you so much for being with us tonight Thank you for having us. Thank you. And happy Women's Day. Yes. <laughs> yes. Couldn't imagine spending it anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>